Welcome, everybody, to this evening's uh, talk by Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. Those of you who are with us physically and those of you who are watching online, I am uh, Mark Tooley, editor of Providence and uh, head of the Institute on Religion and Democracy, uh, in whose offices uh, we are here in downtown D.C. with the great pleasure this evening of having as our speaker Matthew Kranig of Georgetown University's uh, School of Foreign Service. Uh, we've been honored that uh, Matthew has been a speaker at our events uh, several times over the years. Uh, his most recent book is on the reemergence of a great power conflict and competition, which is very pertinent to today's situation regarding the Ukraine. He also has great expertise and has published a book on nuclear strategy, uh, which uh, ominously also pertains to this evening's topic. So, Matthew, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us, and uh, he will speak to us for however long that he would like to speak, but perhaps 15 or 20 minutes, and he has to leave by 10 till 7, so we'll squeeze in as much time for questions or possible as uh, possible. So, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Matt. Well, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, delighted to speak with you. Uh, when, when Mark first invited me to speak, I think it was in response to an article I'd written in um, Foreign Policy magazine uh, about how the United States needs to deal with Russia and China at the same time. And so I think that was supposed to be the topic for tonight, but given what's going on, it seems to make sense to, to pivot to the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, and so I'll talk about that, but if people want to talk about the broader issues and q and i um, happy um, to do that. Uh, so I think for my opening remarks, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what, what I, the broader picture, what, what I think Putin is trying to accomplish, how I think the West's response has gone uh, so far. Uh, and then I do also want to focus a little bit on the nuclear uh, element of this uh, crisis, um, because it's getting some attention, but I think maybe not uh, the attention it deserves, and then uh, perhaps finish by, by broadening out and considering China as well. Um, but, um, you know, uh, first, what, what is Putin doing? And I think for people uh, like me who spend uh, almost all day thinking about defense and, and national security, um, you know, to be honest, I, I wasn't um, that surprised uh, by the invasion when many other people this fall were saying he wouldn't do it, uh, it doesn't make sense. Um, I, I, I was predicting that uh, he would do it. And while it might seem uh, irrational to us, I think, you know, you need to understand um, Putin's goals. Uh, I think he does see himself as this great uh, Russian leader uh, who, after what he's called the greatest catastrophe of the 21st century, the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union, uh, that he's going to restore the, the Russian Empire, uh, that he's going to go down in history as one of uh, the great uh, Russian um, leaders. Uh, and so we've seen him uh, pretty systematically work to uh, do this, uh, the, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, uh, the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Uh, the intervention in Syria in 2015 that reestablished Moscow as a major power broker in the Middle East for the first time since the 1970s, um, interventions in, um, more recently in Kazakhstan, uh, Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, you know, really uh, systematically working, I think, to uh, resurrect uh, Moscow's influence uh, in, these, in these regions. Um, in, in terms of the um, U.S. Uh, response, as, as you probably know, I know everybody's uh, focused on this. You know, the Biden administration has essentially had a, a three-pronged uh, response. Uh, one is sanctions. Um, second is providing arms to the Ukrainians uh, so that they can defend themselves. And then third is reinforcing the eastern flank of NATO. Uh, and these are things that Biden threatened beforehand, that if, if Putin invaded, these are the things that we would do. Uh, I think there was some hope that that would work as a deterrent. Um, if so, it clearly failed. Um, Putin invaded anyway. Um, and so the Biden administration is now executing um, on that threat. Uh, and I think in some ways uh, they've succeeded uh, beyond what uh, people imagined in terms of sanctions, uh, for example, and the Europeans' willingness to go along with sanctions. I think it's gone further than many people thought was possible, probably further than what Putin thought uh, was possible. Um, in, in other areas, I, I, you know, my own assessment is I think the, the White House has been a little bit um, too cautious. Uh, so when it comes to uh, providing arms uh, to the Ukrainians, for example, we just read today uh, that they've um, rejected this Polish offer to provide uh, 
uh, Russian fighter jets to uh, the Ukrainians for fear that it would be too escalatory uh, with Russia. Uh, and then when it comes to reinforcing the eastern flank of NATO, uh, they've, they've taken uh, some steps. The French have provided, uh, sent some forces to Romania. We've sent some uh, fighters to Estonia. Um, we've sent a, a, a thousand or so forces to Germany. Um, but you know what, what many defense experts were saying on the eve of the invasion was, you know, we need to imagine what happens if Putin takes uh, Ukraine. Um, because a couple of months ago, the part of NATO that was exposed directly to Russia was really Estonia and Latvia, you know, the two small Baltic countries in the north. Um, but if Putin succeeds in taking all of Ukraine, uh, if it um, uh, looks like he's getting more control over Belarus's foreign and defense policy, uh, Belarus just changed its constitution several weeks ago to allow Russia to stage uh, nuclear forces there. Uh, so Putin's essentially extending nuclear deterrence again for the first time since uh, since the end of the, the Cold War. Uh, and so, wish I had a map, but suddenly there's seven uh, NATO allies directly exposed uh, to uh, Russian uh, forces. And so what, what is the defense strategy we would need uh, to deal with that? Uh, and um, you know, um, uh, and then what are the forces we need to implement that? I think those are the kinds of reinforcements we, sh we should be thinking about, and, and we're nowhere near, near that currently. Um, finally, on, on the West's response, uh, there's been a lot of talk of a no-fly zone. Uh, the White House has uh, said that doesn't make sense. Um, and um, I, I think some creative thinking is, is required here. You know, a t typical no-fly zone, you know, as the White House uh, has suggested, does mean, you know, shooting down Russian planes if they fly into it. Uh, but I think if, if we look at the 2008 intervention in Georgia, um, uh, George W. Bush, um, as Russia was invading Georgia, uh, said we're conducting a humanitarian mission to help the Georgians. And he sent U.S. Uh, Air Force planes and U.S. naval ships on, on a humanitarian mission. Uh, and um, the Russian forces were moving toward Tbilisi, and then they stopped short. And, and so why did they stop short? We'll never know. Uh, but many well-placed analysts think that it was uh, George Bush essentially saying, get out of the way, we're coming, uh, that caused Putin to stop short for fear of escalation. Uh, so I think often it's been, uh, you know, the White House and the West worried about escalation with Russia, and, and for good reason, uh, but, but Putin should also worry about escalation. So I think if, you know, the Biden administration announced today we're conducting a humanitarian mission, we're sending uh, naval uh, uh, ships or, or U.S. planes, uh, to uh, the western part of Ukraine, to uh, Lviv or, or other cities, um, that uh, that could make a lot of sense, both for humanitarian uh, reasons and, and also for strategic reasons. It would make it much more difficult, of course, for Putin to conquer uh, the entire country if you had U.S. or NATO forces in, in the west of the country. Okay, fine, fine, uh, nuclear. Um, so uh, Putin uh, so this is another area where people who focus on this weren't, weren't um, surprised. Uh, so Russia has a nuclear strategy that's been referred to as the escalate to de-escalate strategy. Um, but uh, essentially the idea is that the West is afraid of nuclear weapons. Uh, Putin and, and Russia are not. And so if they get into a conflict that they'll make nuclear threats early on, um, if necessary, maybe even use nuclear weapons, uh, one or two or three, uh, to convince the rest of the world to say, Oh, oh my God, what are we doing? Are we really going to fight a nuclear war over Ukraine or whatever it is? Let, let's back down and give Putin uh, what he wants. Uh, and so this was um, essentially written into Russian strategy in the early 2000s. Uh, and so, you know, specialists like me thought, oh, this is an interesting change, but it didn't seem like there was any real prospect of conflict. Uh, and then 2014 was a big wake-up call, at, at least for me, of, oh, this is, this is real. And uh, many people didn't realize it at the time, but 2014 invasion of Ukraine, I think, really was a nuclear uh, crisis. Um, so as Putin was invading Crimea and the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, he was giving public statements uh, saying things like, quote, Russia is a major nuclear power. It's best not to mess with us. Uh, Russian officials were giving other similar threats to European uh, capitals, essentially saying you could become the target of a nuclear strike if, if you don't play your cards right. Um, and he didn't put nuclear weapons on uh, high alert in that crisis, but he later said that he, he thought about it. And, and so we're, we're seeing a replay of that strategy um, right now. And um, you know, not that I always have uh, so much foresight, but uh, you know, back in November, I was saying this Ukraine crisis uh, 
is going to become a nuclear crisis soon. This is what Russia does. Uh, and, um, uh, and as soon as the invasion began, Putin made uh, threats, like if the West gets involved, they'll experience consequences they've never experienced in, in history. Um, I think it was last week he put nuclear weapons, announced that he was putting nuclear weapons on high alert. Um, so this is the first time Russia has done this since the uh, end of the Cold War. Uh, and so putting weapons on, on alert essentially means getting them ready uh, for use. Um, so unclear if he's actually done this yet or is just saying he's doing it. Uh, the Pentagon said there's no major muscle movements, but putting them on alert would mean sending nuclear submarines to sea, um, uh, moving out mobile nuclear armed missiles from bases, uh, loading up um, bombers with, with nuclear bombs. Um, and, uh, you know, the hope is that that would be enough, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the West would see that and say we don't want a nuclear war with Russia. And, and I think to some degree this has been uh, successful. You know, every time the White House or NATO leaders say we have to be careful, we don't want escalation with a nuclear Russia, uh, that, uh, that is the message that Putin wants them uh, to take away. Um, so, so would Russia actually um, use nuclear weapons? And I don't want to alarm anyone. I don't think the probability is, is high. I think it's very low. But I, I can't imagine scenarios where Russia would use nuclear weapons um, in Ukraine. Um, so for example, if, if Ukraine and the West are successful in pushing Russian forces uh, out, uh, Putin thinks that he's on the verge of, of losing uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, this could be a humiliating defeat. He might be ousted in a coup at home. I do think that he would use a nuclear weapon or two or three uh, before he uh, outright uh, loses. Uh, and um, Putin has a, a large stockpile, 2,000 or so, of so-called uh, tactical or non-strategic nuclear weapons. Um, so basically any weapon you can imagine, Russia puts a nuke on it. Uh, they have nuclear-armed um, depth charges, nuclear-armed torpedoes, nuclear-armed uh, mines, uh, nuclear-armed surface-to-air missiles to go after airplanes nuclear armed missile defense interceptors to go after um, incoming missiles, uh, nuclear armed short range missiles, nuclear gravity bombs, uh, air, nuclear air launch missiles, sea launch missiles. Uh, so they have a wide range of options uh, to choose from. So they could use a nuclear weapon on, say, a NATO or Ukrainian ship, um, uh, Ukrainian forces on the battlefield, a small Ukrainian city, uh, and essentially say, you know, let's, uh, you know, sue for peace on terms favorable to Russia or else there's uh, more, more where this um, came from. Uh, and unfortunately, the um, United States doesn't have a, a great response to this. Um, if it happened against a NATO ally, if we were at war in, say, Poland, I, I think the United States uh, does have some off-the-shelf ideas of, of how we would deal with that. Um, but in, in Ukraine, we've already said military options are off the table. Uh, and so, you know, if he used nuclear weapons, I'm not sure uh, how we would respond, probably diplomatic protest, UN Security Council meetings, maybe more sanctions. Um, but, um, you know, we've already said that we're not going to get involved um, militarily. And so I think that's another reason that this could look attractive to Putin, that he can use nuclear weapons and there's not going to be a, a serious uh, military response. All right, the, the final uh, point I'll make broadening out even further and then look forward to coming to you for, for Q&A and discussion. Uh, is that before all of this happened, uh, almost every defense expert I knew said, uh, Russia's old news, uh, the Middle East is old news, uh, China is the rising power, we need to focus everything on uh, China. Um, and um, they have a point, uh, China is a serious challenge. Uh, the military balance in, in Asia is uh, shifting away from the United States uh, towards China. Um, the head of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, uh, former head, uh, a person in charge of U.S. forces in Asia, uh, predicted that China will try to invade Taiwan within the next six years. Um, and uh, the last National Defense Strategy Commission report uh, man mandated by Congress um, said that the United States could lose uh, that war. Um, so uh, that, that's a serious problem. Uh, what we see now, though, is that we can't just ignore uh, Europe, we can't just ignore Russia. I think that was the Biden administration's um, hope, that they would uh, put relations with Russia on, quote, a stable and predictable footing, uh, is what they said they were hoping for. Um, you know, negotiate the new START arms control agreement, uh, park the Russia problem, uh, get back into the Iran nuclear deal, park the Middle East, uh, and focus everything on China. Uh, and as we're seeing now, um, Europe and Asia are more complicated. Uh, uh, sorry, Europe and the Middle East, we can't just uh, park uh, those problems and, and focus on Asia. 
So I think the biggest um, challenge facing uh, the Defense Department, really the free world, is how do you deal with Russia and China at the same time? You know, two autocratic, revisionist great powers, um, nuclear armed, uh, China drastically increasing its nuclear arsenal, trying to become a nuclear superpower, uh, that are working together. And we saw Xi essentially green light Putin's invasion uh, just before it happened. Uh, and that's a, that's a really hard um, challenge. And, and the truth is I, I don't think the Pentagon can deal with uh, both of them um, right now. Uh, and so figuring out a free world defense strategy to deal with Russia and China at the same time alongside our allies, I think, is going to be uh, critical to maintaining uh, peace and stability going forward. We've really been fortunate for the past, what, 80 uh, years or so, you know, zero great power wars. Um, but I do, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately can imagine plausible scenarios where we're in war with Russia, you know, by the end of the month, at war with China uh, by the end of the month, or at war with both of them uh, by the end of the month. And um, uh, we need to uh, strengthen our defenses and our deterrence to prevent that from happening. So maybe I'll end my remarks there and open it up to questions and, and comments. Yes. If anyone who has a question would uh, speak to the microphone and help those who are watching online. Uh, Preston Knoll, Tradition Family and Property. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Dr. Peter Pry. Mm -hmm. He's written a few articles on this recently. Would you care to give your assessment of that? Yeah, well, well um, so Peter Pry is um, one of the leading experts on uh, EMP, electromagnetic pulse, and, and the threat that poses. Um, so I'm not sure if I've seen the most uh, recent articles, but. Um, you know, uh, one of the eff effects of a nuclear weapon is, is an electromagnetic uh, pulse. Uh, so essentially, it would send out these, uh, this pulse, an electromagnetic pulse, uh, that would disable electronics. And so one of the threats uh, people have worried about is that maybe a country like North Korea or maybe Russia, you know, wouldn't directly conduct a nuclear attack on Kiev or uh, New York or Washington. Um, but what they could do is detonate a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere above the city uh, to where there's, there's not the blast damage, there's not the radiation damage, but you get that EMP effect, um, essentially turn out the lights, you know, fry a, a electrical grids uh, and things like that. Um, so th that is a real threat. It's, it's uh, one of the effects of nuclear weapons. You can see how it might be attractive to uh, countries. They could uh, create some devastation short of, you know, a, a, a kinetic attack. Um, and, and there are things the United States uh, could do to um, harden our uh, grid against this. Um, but so far, you know, people like uh, Dr. Pry have been making the case, but you know, haven't been, hasn't been able to build the political will to do it because, uh, because it's expensive, but um, it is, the, is the main reason. Um, but I think, um, you know, for many people, I think they think of nuclear weapons as, you know, Cold War stuff, humanity's moved on. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think nuclear weapons remain the ultimate instrument of military force. Uh, still, great powers find them uh, useful, as we're seeing now with Putin's nuclear threats. And so as great power rivalry has returned in recent years, uh, I think the salience of nuclear weapons in international politics uh, will resume with it. And um, you know, people uh, may start thinking more seriously about how do we protect against um, EMP attacks. Good evening. I'm Darren Duke from the Philos Project. Uh, China and Russia seem naturally not to have allies. And so it seems that they're going to have a, a larger challenge. They have each other, but they don't have a larger coalition like the free world does. Um, does that portend positive things in the long term uh, for the free world? Or is there some other strength they do have that you think will, will, will win out? Yeah, good, good question. And um, Mark mentioned my 2020 book. Um, on democracies versus autocracies. And so it's called The Return of Great Power Rivalry, Democracies versus Autocracies from the Ancient World to the U.S. and China. So it started with the Greeks and the Persians uh, 2,500 years ago, all the way up through the Cold War. Kind of looked, looked at the strengths and weaknesses of democracies, looked at the strengths and weaknesses of autocracies. You know, found that democracies tend to do pretty well uh, in these competitions. You know, the Cold War wasn't really a, um, uh, an exception. It was kind of the, the rule that the, the, the freer society often uh, emerged um, on top. 
Uh, and so one of, the weakness, uh, one of the strengths that democracies have is that they tend to be better at building alliances and partnerships, uh, winning over allies. Um, autocracies, dictators uh, tend to not be um, so good at that. Uh, and so I think this is uh, absolutely true in the competition today. You know, the United States has 30 formal treaty allies. Uh, combined, we make up uh, uh, around 60 percent of global GDP. Um, so people talk about American decline, which, which isn't really true. We're holding steady at between 20 and 25 percent of global GDP, uh, kind of useful share of, of uh, or measure of global power, as political scientists often use. Um, you know, with, with our allies, though, 60 percent, you know, we have a really preponderance of power. Um, Russia and China, on the other hand, don't have um, these kind of uh, formal allies. And, and to understand why, you know, I think we can just look at Russia's history over the past hundred years. Let's look at, you know, the way Russia treats its allies, uh, sort of aligned with, um, you know, Germany during World War II. They fought a war with each other, um, created the Warsaw Pact. The major military action the Warsaw Pact during, saw during the Cold War was Russia invading its own members, uh, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. Um, Russia and China had an, a previous alliance uh, during the Cold War. Uh, that ended with them fighting a war against each other in 1969, uh, the Russians threatening a uh, nuclear war against China. Um, then after the end of the Cold War, the, the Russians created the Commonwealth of Independent States, an alliance among the former Soviet republics, uh, then invaded two of those countries, uh, Ukraine and Georgia. Um, so, so Russia and China are working more closely together, uh, and I do worry about that. They're engaging in joint military exercises, joint weapons production. Um, um, but um, they, they still have real differences, and I, I think it's just as likely that Russia and China fight each other uh, as, they, uh, you know, as they have um, in the past. Um, so, so that is our, our strength and one of their weaknesses. Still, I do think we need to worry about dealing with Russia and China at the same time. Um, you know, they could coordinate dual attacks against our alliances. China attacked Taiwan, uh, Russia attacked Poland. But even if they don't coordinate, uh, one of them could exploit the opportunity uh, created by the other. You know, if the conflict in Europe escalates and, and the Pentagon's tied down in Europe, I think that would be very attractive for Taiwan to think, now I have a free hand in Asia, um, or, or vice versa. Um, so, um, um, yeah, I do think um, coming up with a strategy to deal with both of them at the same time is, is important, even if there are real tensions within their partnership, and I, I do think there are real tensions. No, thanks a lot. Uh, Christian Forstner, Hans Seidel Foundation, which is a think tank, yeah, um, affiliated with the conservative political party of Bavaria, Christian Social Union. No, thank you, Matthew. Uh, fascinating talk. A um, couple of questions. The uh, first one, yeah, nuclear deterrence. So, um, from your research and experience yeah, from the Cold War era, yeah, when you say um, we cannot exclude the use of a nuclear bomb, yeah, so low yield, whatever, yeah, nuclear bomb by Putin and Russia, but how does nuclear deterrence still work? And what's our um, um, nuclear strategy, yeah, with a V, an enemy, yeah, uh, that is willing to use it, yeah, and, and going to maybe to be retaliated, yeah, to full extinction. So. What is our Cold War experience, yeah, and how can we avoid it? Yeah. Second, second question is uh, when you state this geopolitical uh, great power competition, what is our strategy? Our strategy was, it was with the Russia and partly with the China as well, to slowly integrate them yeah, into the world of democratic nations yeah, or the civilized nations yeah, into the multilateral agreements. Yeah, so be it with Russia, yeah, modernization partnership, or China, yeah, bringing China to, the, to a rules-based international order, yeah, uh, World Trade Organization, and so on and so on. Yeah. So how, how, do, how do we deal with geopolitical rivalry and competition right from the very beginning? Like uh, deterrence, yeah, confrontation, containment is the only thing which works? Or do we still have like an, um, a more positive yeah, strategy? Yeah? Uh, which now, obviously, uh, with regards to Russia, yeah, has completely failed, yeah, to, at least in our European German perspective. Yeah, and and and, and the third one is, uh, take yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, no, the first one is the nuclear deterrence. 
No, I've got it. Yeah, limited nuclear limited. deterrence. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the second is uh, well, I mean, geopolitical rivalry. And uh, 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 how do you deal with with uh, such hostile regimes? When we believe we can still influence it and bring it to a more positive way, and 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 the third one, yeah, if you analyze yeah, the current situation yeah, with Russia, yeah, war in Ukraine, war with Russia, do you see looking back that we, the West, could have done anything better mm. to avoid this war scenario and the war situation today in Europe? Great, thanks. Great questions and. Um, uh, you know, I, I feel like um, we've lived through 10 years of history in the past two weeks. There have just been so many rapid um, developments and, and many surprises. And, and one of the surprises for me was, was Germany's uh, announcement to rapidly increase defense spending. I didn't think I'd ever see this uh, in my lifetime. And, you know, almost overnight, you know, this uh, $100 billion uh, um, increase. So uh, that's, I think, welcome and, and it's part of what's going to be necessary if the free world's going to defend against uh, Russia and China at the same time. Um, so on your question, does, does nuclear deterrence still work? Um, you know, s um, so I think often people learn kind of mutually assured destruction. They have nuclear weapons. We have nuclear weapons. We deter each other. And, and so there's peace and stability. Um, but I actually think that's where kind of nuclear deterrence theory and strategy begins, not where it ends, uh, because nuclear armed states still uh, have an incentive to try to use nuclear weapons to coerce uh, their, their adversaries. Um, but, but how do they do that when your adversary has nuclear weapons? Can you really threaten to, to start a suicidal nuclear war? Um, so essentially, countries have tried to figure out ways around um, you know, nuclear deterrence, mutually assured destruction. Uh, and one of the strategies that countries have come to time and time again is limited nuclear war. Because you know, when we think about mutually assured destruction, we think, OK, I'm going to hit you with thousands of nuclear weapons. You're going to hit me with thousands of nuclear weapons. Uh, we're both deterred. Um, but what happens if your enemy uses, you know, one or, or two or three nuclear weapons? You know, what do you do? Uh, and, and so this is essentially uh, Russia's strategy, so limited nuclear war strategy, that they would use a small number of nuclear weapons. Uh, and then how do you respond? You know, imagine you're Joe Biden or, or Macron or, uh, you know, a Western leader. Uh, they've just uh, used a nuclear weapon against Mariupol, you know, or, or against um, uh, Warsaw. You know, what do we do? I was, I was testifying on, um, uh, to U.S. Congress on, on this exact issue, and one senator, actually a Democratic senator, said, you're telling me Putin thinks he can nuke us? Uh, if he nukes us, we're going to nuke him back so hard, you know, Russia is going to be a, uh, you know, a smoking ruin. And I said, okay, but remember, he's only hit Warsaw or whatever so far. Paris is still intact. London is, you know, if, if we launch a massive nuclear attack, he'll retaliate. You know, do you really want to destroy the West? To, and he's like, oh, that, you know, that's a good point. You know, uh, um, <laughs> um, uh, others, you know, I, I've talked to said, well, let's, um, you know, we're not going to fight a nuclear war with Putin over Estonia or Ukraine. Let, let's just back down. And, and I said, okay, well, you know, we could do that. But then what is the message you send to Putin? You tell him, threaten nuclear weapons and do whatever you want. Take Paris. We're, we're not, you know, if nukes are on the table, we're, we're cowards. We're not going to do anything. And so the uh, 2018 U.S. Nuclear Posture Review um, essentially said that our response to, to Russia's strategy in particular is going to be to threaten limited nuclear use of our own. Uh, so Putin, you use one or two. We'll use one or two or four. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the hope isn't that we fight a limited nuclear war, but rather Putin says, oh, oh, shoot, I thought if I used a nuclear weapon, I win, but now you're telling me I just get into this messy nuclear war. Uh, never mind. So I think that's why I said I, if this happened against Estonia or Poland or the United States, I think we have a strategy for it. You know, we'd say don't do it or else we'll retaliate with nukes. If he used one, we could use one back. But with Ukraine, you know, it's not a NATO ally. We've already said military options are on the table. And so we don't really have a good strategy for deterring nuclear attack um, there. Um, on, on great power competition, so you're, you're right, after the end of the Cold War, you know, there was this hope that uh, is the end of history. Everybody's, every country is becoming democratic, uh, capitalist. Uh, peace had broken out. And there really was this hope that both Russia and China uh, would become responsible stakeholders, was one of the terms used, you know, in a rules-based international system. And I think the hope was that they'd um, become democratic, they'd be integrated into the global economy, their foreign policies would be moderated, 
you know, that China would become a kind of big Germany in uh, Asia, you know, Russia would become a big Germany in Eastern Europe. Um, and, and that's not what happened. You know, our, our assumptions were wrong. Instead of uh, being incorporated into the system, both Russia and China have decided to fight back against it. Uh, and, you know, both places are run by dictators, and so they see the, threat of, see the spread of free markets and, and political freedom uh, as a threat. Uh, they see the spread of U.S. partnerships and alliances into their regions uh, as a threat, and so they're, you know, pushing back to revise and, and tear down this system. Um, so, so what should be the goal, I think, is another way of asking your question. What, what do we want to achieve with Russia and China? Uh, and so this became a, a hobby uh, of mine and, uh, after 2018 when the United States said great power competition is the foremost goal of the United States. So I'd ask senior U.S. officials, well, what is, what is the goal of this competition? You know, competition in and of itself isn't, isn't a goal. Uh, you know, how do we win? And I got, um, so, I, so I think the answer, we, we don't have a goal yet, uh, and I got many different interesting answers from different people. So, you know, one senior official, I won't name by name, said, well, well there is no goal. You know, there's always been great power competition. There will always be great power competition. Uh, we just have to compete. But I, I don't think, you know, competition forever with Russia and China with the threat of nuclear war hanging over us is, is really what we want as a long-term goal. You know, another one said, well, we just want to avoid uh, war. And I said, okay, well, we avoid war, but, um, you know, our alliances in Europe and Asia are broken. Uh, you know, the uh, autocracy spreads across the world as, as countries emulate, you know, China and Russia. You know, the, the global economy is uh, bifurcated into these different spheres of influence. You know, is that, is that a success? And, you know, this official said, no, you're right. I need, need to think about that more. So, so I don't think we're, we're clear about what the goal is. My, my answer would be, I think in the long term, we still want that responsible stakeholder. I think it would be great if Russia and China became big Germanys who were democratic, capitalists, played by the rules. Um, but I, I don't think the way we get there is by cooperation in, in the short term. I, I think we need confrontation uh, in the short term. And, and the, uh, the only theory I can see as to how we get to a cooperative relationship in the long term is if the next generation of Russian and Chinese leaders, or maybe you know, two generations from now of Russian and Chinese leaders, uh, look back at this moment and they say, you know, what Putin did, uh, what she did, that, that didn't work. That didn't work for Berlin. That didn't work for Moscow. Uh, we need to try something different. You know, confronting the West, confronting the United States, it's too difficult. It's too costly uh, for us. Uh, let, let's try a more cooperative approach. So I, I, don't th I think it's too late with Putin and Xi. I think they've made up their minds that they're going to challenge. Um, but if, if we can show that this doesn't work, that this is costly for Russia, this is costly for China, um, maybe the next generation of uh, leaders in those countries would try a different approach. Oh, and then um, there was a third question. Let me go to my notes. Uh, oh, could we have done anything better or different with Russia? Um, I, I, think, I think after 2008 and after 2014, we were um, too cautious. You know, if we had um, uh, admitted Ukraine into NATO um, earlier, I don't think this would have happened. Uh, I think Russia knows that that's a bright red line, that if you attack a NATO member, you get into a war with, with NATO, the United States. That's too costly. Uh, and so I think, you know, by leaving these uh, countries on the periphery between NATO uh, and Russia, we've left them uh, vulnerable. Uh, and I'm not the only person drawing that conclusion. You know, Finland and Sweden are in a similar spot. Uh, and um, they've remained, you know, neutral, not part of NATO for many decades. And just in the past few weeks, you know, opinions really shifted. A majority of Finns support joining um, NATO now. So there are probably other mistakes, but I, I think that's maybe one, that uh, rather we should have been more ambitious, not less ambitious, with uh, NATO expansion. Thanks, Matt. Mark Levecki, Providence, uh, two questions. The first, uh, many people have observed, and you sort of touched on it, that maybe the only thing worse than a Putin victory is a Putin humiliating defeat. And in light of that, people have talked about off-ramps, right? Don't surround your enemy, give him a, a way out. Uh, what is the golden bridge that Putin would accept and that the Ukraine and the West would find also acceptable? That's the, the first. And the second is, if there's a lesson to be drawn from all of this, one of them might be Bombs are good, right? And so what does this do? Is there a proliferation worry, especially mm -hmm. in light of a possible American, you know, retreat from hegemony or international leadership? What does this do for proliferation? Is that a concern? 
Yeah, good, uh, good questions, Mark, and, and thanks, and thanks for the work that you do. Um, uh, so, w w what does an off ramp look like? F first, I think Putin needs to to want an off ramp, and um, I, I'm not sure if, if he does yet. I, I think he wants to continue to push the military campaign and see if he can just uh, take this through brute force uh, rather than uh, some kind of off ramp. And um, you know, we are still in relatively early days. We're two weeks into this. You know, if we, we look back to the U.S. military campaign in um, Iraq, that was two or three weeks, and, and that was quick. So we're, we're still in uh, early days. But, it, but un unfortunately, I do think one way this could end, maybe the most probable way this ends now, is some kind of partition of Ukraine, uh, that Russia succeeds in, in occupying uh, parts of, of, you know, large parts probably of uh, eastern Ukraine. Uh, and then there's some kind of peace negotiation uh, at that point that, that divides um, the country. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons I think a humanitarian intervention in, in the western part of the country could make sense if there are U.S. or NATO forces on the ground there. Um, makes it more likely that Putin doesn't take the entire um, country. Um, so that's not what I would want. I would want to completely defend uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity, push Russian forces all the way out. Um, but. but um, yeah, right now, I think that scenario seems less likely to me than some kind of, you know, partition of, of the country. Um, on, uh, nucle are nuclear weapons, um, you know, uh, desirable? Um, and it's not the question you asked, but I'll, I'll answer it anyway because it's come up a lot. You know, people often say, well, Ukraine had nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War. Maybe they should have just kept them. Uh, that, that's kind of misleading, though, because, um, you know, it was um, Soviet, um, what became Russian uh, military, uh, you know, on, on Ukraine, and as the Soviet Union broke apart, they suddenly had these nuclear weapons sitting there, uh, but the Ukrainian government didn't have operational control over them. You know, not clear if they could have gotten operational control. They probably would have had to physically attack the, the Russian forces and take them. Um, and, um, you know, the, uh, the future they would have been looking, remember, into the Cold War, you know, the United States is the uh, unipolar power. You know, I, th I think the United States would have treated a nuclear-armed Ukraine for the past 25 years like a North Korea or Iran, you know, probably sanctions, uh, um, threats of military strikes. Um, and, and so I think they made the right decision um, at the time to, to give up the nuclear weapons, return them to Russia in exchange for being welcomed by the West, you know, economic aid from the United States, good diplomatic relations. Um, but, but what lesson do other countries um, take from this? E you know, I, I do think uh, American uh, power in American nuclear weapons are, are one of the most important uh, driving forces of nonproliferation around the world. Uh, you know, 30, maybe more than 30 countries rely on nuclear weapons for their security. Uh, so the uh, 30 other members of NATO, Japan, South Korea, Australia, arguably others, uh, and we essentially make a deal with them. We say, don't build your own nuclear weapons, you can rely on U.S. nuclear weapons for your security. So I think as long as that um, holds and, and people think that that's uh, serious, uh, I think it's unlikely that U.S. allies would, would build their own nuclear weapons. Um, but if that started to call into question, then I do think that the allies in vulnerable security environments will rethink it, you know, Japan, South Korea, Poland. Uh, in fact, um, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe um, just in um, uh, recent days has said something about how Japan um, should build um, nuclear weapons or that U.S. Should, should bring nuclear weapons to Japan. Um, so I think that, um, you know, Ukraine has been a wake-up call for many of these small, vulnerable countries, and it's getting them thinking. But um, so, so I think this is an important reason why the United States should maintain a credible deterrent and should strengthen our alliances and partnerships uh, in, in order to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons, because if we get this wrong, I think you're right that uh, countries might relook their options. But it sounds like you think it was wrong not to have accepted Ukraine into NATO membership. Uh, is that correct? And by implication, you would support accepting Ukraine, if it survives, into NATO membership in the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, at, at the time, I think, um, you know, the decision was reasonable. There was a concern by some that al allowing them in would be provocative to Russia. Um, I, I think there were... Um, you know, there, there are kind of political requirements for uh, membership in NATO, and there are concerns about corruption and reforms that needed to take place in, in Ukraine. Um, so I think it was understandable at the time, but, you know, looking back in hindsight, yeah, I, I think that if we had allowed Ukraine into NATO, it's uh, pretty unlikely that, that Russia, that we'd have this war uh, today. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think it was a mistake. 
Um, so if Ukraine um, gets out of this, um, I, th I think that um, the case for, for NATO membership would be pretty strong. And, and I think that's one of the things that, um, that maybe we should have threatened before the invasion as a deterrent, uh, that if, uh, you know, that Ukrainian and Georgian membership is currently on, on hold. Uh, we promised at the 2008 NATO Bucharest summit that one day they'd become members, they just needed to make reforms first. But, you know, if we'd threatened if you invade, then we'll make them, uh, you know, they'll defeat you and then we'll make them NATO members. That might have been an, an additional uh, deterrent for Putin. So I do worry about, you know, the other countries in this kind of gray zone between Russia uh, and um, NATO. Um, you know, Georgia is in a vulnerable position. Uh, Russia's already invaded once. You know, are they next? Um, what about uh, Moldova, um, you know, between Romania and, and Russia? Uh, what about Finland and, and Sweden? I think that's less likely, but, um, but um, you know, I, I think Putin's understood now uh, that, that uh, at least this White House isn't going to get into a war if it's not a formal treaty ally. And so I think Putin, uh, you know, I think he's tied down. His military forces are tied down in Ukraine, so a lot depends on, on how this turns out. But if he succeeds in, in taking um, all of Ukraine, uh, then I'm, uh, I'm guessing that that's not going to be sufficient for him. He'll be thinking about what's next. Anybody else? So are there, there are those who, would, who claim that uh, if the West had firmly pr uh, ruled out NATO membership for Ukraine, that would have prevented this war. If the West had done so, would Putin still have invaded Ukraine? I, I think so. I, I think, um, you know, there was these, these negotiations beforehand, and Putin was saying, here are my demands, um, you know, promise that, uh, most prominently promise that um, Ukraine will never become part of NATO. Um, I, I don't think that was a sincere negotiating point. I think that was a pretext for war. I, I think he knew there was no way that um, the United States and NATO would accept that, and that would give him the excuse he needed to invade. Um, I, I think he would have been happy to pocket um, that concession if, if we had given it to him. Uh, but I, I think uh, he still um, uh, would have invaded either. Well, I, I, th I think he would have invaded, um, actually. You know, in, in hindsight, well, I remember, let's see, I was, um, uh, what can I, I was meeting with some uh, Eastern European officials visiting uh, in uh, September. Uh, visiting Washington. And they said, you know, usually when we meet with administration officials, you know, we're worried about security in Eastern Europe. And they say, no, you know, we've got it under control, nothing to worry about. Um, you know, this time, you know, they seemed really worried about a uh, possible war in Ukraine. And we said, no, that, you know, doesn't seem to make sense. And they said, no, we're, we're worried. You know, and we saw the massive buildup over the fall. I mean, so in, in hindsight, I, I think he made this decision some time ago, and this late stage negotiation was just a pretext. I think if we'd said Ukraine's not going to, you know, and we did try in good faith to try other things. What about, um, you know, limits on military forces? That was one of the things he'd mentioned. What about new arms control arrangements? It's one of the things he'd mentioned. Uh, they never seriously negotiated on, on those. So I suspect if we'd said, okay, Ukraine will never join NATO or won't, won't join for 25 years, I think he would have had some other, you know, excuse, Nazis or, or whatever, and would have invaded anyway. Time for a final question. I'll, I'll take a swing at it. <clears throat> so we've talked about high-end combat and nuclear weapons. There's also a discussion of insurgency and a grinding insurgency in the Ukraine. Uh, Dr. Ben Conable, Real Clear Defense, has published some work saying just today 186,000 troops will be required for Russia to occupy Ukraine completely. That will require him to do a port and starboard rotation of forces in and out. That's not something that is sustainable from a Russian perspective. And then you add to that an effective uh, Western-supported insurgency. Um, what are your thoughts about that as an option for bleeding Russia white? Yes. Well, and um, so I've kind of touched on all these in uh, a way, but maybe I'll just, um, you know, systematically lay it out. Um, so the Atlantic Council think tank where I work published um, a piece about a week ago on scenarios for how the war in Ukraine might end. Uh, and it became the, the most read piece in the history of the Atlantic Council, 180,000 readers in uh, a couple of days, because um, a lot of interest in, in this subject. And they laid out um, five scenarios. You know, one is Russia quickly wins. You know, maybe, maybe that's still possible, although looking less likely. You know, one is uh, the miracle on the Dnieper, uh, that the Ukrainians and the West push Russia, Russian forces out. Uh, 
Um, you know, I, th I think that's looking unlikely. You know, third is direct Russia-NATO war, and, and there are a, a, a number of ways this could um, escalate. Um, fourth is uh, some kind of partitioned um, settlement, as, as we discussed. Uh, and then fifth is, is this one, that this becomes uh, a long-running insurgency, another Afghanistan um, for Russia. And that, that does seem plausible to me. I mean, you know, even if Russia succeeds in taking Kiev, putting in some kind of puppet um, leader, you know, do the Ukrainian people just uh, accept that? I mean, I, th I think what we've seen over the past few weeks is that uh, they probably wouldn't, or at least a significant, uh, you know, portion of the population would not. Uh, and so I, I think that could become a, a, a years or maybe even decades long um, in, insurgency. So I think that is one of the the possible outcomes uh, of, of this conflict. Matt, do you want to end on a, with a few words of optimism? <laughs> well, well, maybe I can, um, uh, so I'll talk about the, the book that I'm working on now, uh, and it's called um, Force for Good, How, How American Power Makes the World Safer, Richer, and Freer. And it's a um, combination of um, kind of Robert Kagan, if you know his work, and, and Steven Pinker. Um, you know, because Pinker is this radical optimist who, who just says, look at all the data, the world is getting um, so much better. And, and I think he's right. You know, if you, you know, current headlines aside, you know, the world uh, over the past 80 years has been much safer than any time in human history. No great power wars. Uh, it used to be that 1 to 2 percent of uh, the human population from the beginning of recorded human history until 1945 could expect to die in armed conflict. Uh, now that number is less than a tenth of 1 percent. Um, if you look at prosperity, um, the world's richer than it's ever been. You know, um, poverty rates in 1945 were 66% of the world's population. Now it's 10%. You know, still too high, but, but much better. Uh, and if you look at uh, freedom, we often forget that um, you know, Europe and, and Asia was mostly autocratic uh, up until 1945. And then now, you know, all of Europe is, or most, most, almost all of Europe is democratic, you know, major powers in, in Asia. Um, are democratic. Uh, and so, you know, the, the world is better uh, according to these objective measures, and, and why is that the case? And, you know, so Pinker, if you know his work, has these com seven complicated factors. But what I argue, I, I think it's really American um, leadership in, in the world that the United States has made over the past uh, 80 years, uh, promoting security through our alliances and extended nuclear deterrence in Europe and Asia, uh, promoting uh, free markets and, and globalization to um, uh, make the world a more prosperous place, and uh, promoting uh, good governance, democracy, freedom, human rights. You know, not perfectly and not always evenly, but, um, you know, I think it's no coincidence that the safest, uh, richest, freest parts of the world are, are those that have been most under um, American influence over the past uh, 80 years, Europe and, and East Asia. Uh, and so um, I, I think that's uh, optimistic if you look at the big sweep of things. Uh, the world um, it, it has been getting better, uh, and I think it has been because of a powerful and engaged um, United States. And, and despite the talk of American decline, I think the United States still is the, the foremost power uh, on Earth. Uh, and so uh, if we continue to have the will to uh, lead in the world, uh, I think we can continue to make the world a better place.